Dear friends, my name is Hamlet Narsesian, and I have been running an uh, Armenian educational TV program by the title of Haytun for many years now. And we have conducted our uh, show in Armenian language for Armenian audience for years. We have come to the conclusion that it is time that we uh, conduct also our program and our subjects in English. And the subject is so vital for our, our Armenian community we decided to invite to our studio a member of a younger generation of the scientists. And we will discuss today the subject of the Armenian ancient history, uh, the subject that is very crucial for all of us. And it has not been, uh, it has not been uh, looked at or discussed in a proper manner for, uh, for many years, I would say about 100 years or so. That is the reason why today's guest, my today's guest, uh, an honored young scientist, will talk to us and discuss with us the subject that is very dear to our hearts. The subject is the ancient Armenian civilization, ancient Armenian history, and the distortion of certain, by certain people of our history. My today's guest is, um, Vahan Setyan, and I'll read very briefly his uh, biography, and you would have an idea who the man is. Uh, Vahan Setyan is an organizational psychologist, lecturer, author. As an independent researcher of ancient civilizations and comparative mythology, he has not only uncovered dimensions of thought and perspectives that are generally overlooked by archaeologists, anthropologists, and comparative linguists, but also undeniably noticed uh, intentional falsi falsifications and negligence of re relevant information in historical books which are essential to understand human history, especially the human history after the last ice age. He is author of Enigma of the Armenian Alphabet, Letters, Protons and Paradoxes, and we are awaiting for his upcoming publications, Time Walk, in search for our, uh, architects of civilization, which is anticipated to be released soon. He has been invited to numerous television and uh, radio interviews and video conferences on ancient history, particularly about Armenian culture and world mythology. He is here today with us uh, to not only talk about these mentioned top, uh, topics, but also about the statue of status of Armenian history in contemporary literature and media outlets. We are here to listen what he has gathered from his collaborations, feedbacks and discussions about, his, about these topics and what especially are the opportunities as well as the challenges facing the uh, important areas of inquiry. Now, uh, since I mentioned uh, Van Setian is a young scientist. He holds PhD in industrial psychology, and uh, he is heavily involved in researching the ancient Armenian history. Van, what brings you to that subject is my question. Well, th uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here, really, because the, the importance of the subject is, is so vital that everyone in, in the world needs to hear about it. Uh, well. <clears throat> when I was examining ancient civilizations, um, I realized that uh, the further we go back in time, uh, the more we see <clears throat> the Armenian culture, their language, uh, and their heritage immersed in various continents all over the world. Uh, we can go to India, we can go to Sumeria, we can go to Egypt, we can go to North, even South America, and we can see fingerprints of the Armenian people, uh, particularly. And the problem is that um, when you look at the historians and Egyptologists, Azirologists and so on, when they look at this information and data, uh, one of the, the fundamental problems of that is they don't know the Armenian language and culture. So they look for certain items without knowing uh, what they're missing and they come to certain erroneous conclusions. That's the biggest problem. So. Me taking that extra dimension, that extra effort for me to find all these things, I realized that you know some of the Egyptologists are incorrect in their conclusions. Uh, whoever has examined the, the Phoenicians and the Sumerians and so also, um, they're also wrong. Uh, in other words, they, they completely skip an entire dimension of the Armenian language and history. And that's the problem. Uh, the conclusions are going to be incorrect because your premises are incorrect. 
Hence the reason why I wanted to delve more into this subject, because the more we unearth the Armenian history and culture from under ash and debris, the more we can correct the path the way we look at history and ancient history and how it evolved throughout time. Uh, you just mentioned the fact that many, many uh, scientists that are studying the ancient civilizations by not knowing or speaking Armenian, they just bypass the Armenian history and they fall in a trap that they can get out of. Meaning, if you are studying history of Shumer, if you don't speak Armenian, then you are trying to translate that from Assyrian, mm -hmm. from somewhere else. But if you don't speak Armenian, you can translate the so-called Urartian uh, Biaina uh, language mm -hmm. into today's correct meanings because you have to speak Armenian. Sure. Armenian has been the source, the grandfather of all these languages. How can you forget the grandfather and start talking about grandchildren? Right. Well, this is the problem uh, when it comes to Armenian history. We have three groups of people primarily. We have the ignorant ones. They, have <coughs> they don't know what they're missing. So they will talk about the Armenian language or not even talk about it at all and realize that they're actually saying something meaningful, which they're not. We also have the, the willfully ignorant. Basically, they, they know what it is, but they do not talk about it. This is where the falsifications lie. Uh, we have the third one, the, uh, when they actually know all this, and they still deny, and they come with erroneous conclusions forcefully. And this is where insanity begins. They, it's it's uh, absolutely outrageous the way they, they handle this uh, dimension. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Edwin, uh, <coughs> Edwin uh, Huddle, Abbott, um, he actually wrote, wrote a book called, called Flatland. In other words, the inhabitants had uh, two dimensions and they didn't know what the third dimension was. Mm. So if you're a two-dimensional object, you don't know what the third dimension is. You don't know what the third dimension is. In other words, you cannot visualize what it is. So your world has to do with two dimensions. Now, the third dimension is the Armenian language. Mm -hmm. So now you realize uh, the, the, the view that you have now, the things that you haven't seen before. So all these scholars and Egyptologists and, and uh, so, uh, Sumerologists and so on, once they realize this new dimension, their whole perspective changes. And it becomes irreconcilable with what they have done in two dimensions. So you have to realize that. Everybody needs to realize this. All the future scholars, if you're not going to utilize the Armenian language, uh, you are missing a big picture, the, the puzzle, the, the other piece of the puzzle. Uh, we, for example, in, in 1800s, you had many German and British scholars who have always emphasized the importance of utilizing the Armenian language as, as key. Um, you know, you have <coughs> You have Robert Ellis, for example, he will do that. Uh, Hilbrecht, for example, Hermann Hilbrecht, he, he even said that the Hittite language is the Armenian language itself, mm -hmm. or the old Armenian language itself. So there's a reason why they were saying it, because they, they could see it. But something happened uh, during Abdul Hamid times. You know, you had the, the first Armenian genocide in 1800s, and then in the, in the early 1900s, uh, for the sake of uprooting all those people from there. And that's where the distortion started, all the way until, I can say, maybe 1990s. But we still have falsifiers out there, and they know who they are, and they know that I know that who they are. And uh, I've talked to them a couple of times. Well, uh, let me put my five cents into this. My years of my studies have brought me to a very interesting conclusion. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the third dimension. Mm -hmm. The third dimension of understanding the falsification and their motivation is mm -hmm. very hard one but once you get to it it's very simple sure. to eliminate the armenian people out of the um, asia minor mm -hmm. to get rid of armenians altogether as uh, lawrence of arabia said we have to give the land to the west and we have to give the people armenians to the russians mm -hmm. that's their plan mm -hmm. now trying to understand now today what has happened and why they are doing this it's very simple physical genocide cultural genocide, 
and falsification of history. Mm -hmm. This is the third dimension mm -hmm. that they had to carry out to be able to get rid of the Armenians from Asia Minor. Sure. So this way, there will be no Armenians and there will be nobody to claim the rights over that land. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the people, there is no claim over the land. Sure. Today, nobody is talking about Sumerians and Assyrians, whether or not they lived in those territories or not. Nobody is talking about Akkadians anymore. Mm -hmm. Those nations don't exist. So they can't come back and claim for land. Sure. So that's why the history is uh, explaining or showing or discussing it the right way. But in Armenian case, Armenian history has to be distorted by them in order to get rid of the Armenians and their legal claim over the land. Sure, absolutely. And, and you can see that. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary, really. Uh, amongst all the ethnic groups, you have the Armenian people. I mean, if you're going to consider them to be insignificant, you know, why are you stealing their heritage? I mean, there is a reason why. Uh, I mean, uh, if you don't find their history important, uh, you're not going to do anything to distort it. But in, uh, the reality is, um, it's like a, a, a food feast. They, everybody just tries to get it uh, like a small piece uh, on their own. And uh, whether it's in Georgia, whether it's Azerbaijan or Turkey, Whatever is the Armenian heritage, they claim it as their own. I mean, besides from that, you know, you can see, let's say, a picture from 10 years ago of a church with Armenian letters on them. And then uh, 10 years later, you see those Armenian letters gone. gone. I mean, if you're, if you're doing that, there is a reason why you're doing it. I mean, why would you distort an ancient civilization's work? I mean, there has to be this evil notion of something that is behind it and and that's what it is i mean if it's insignificant you're going to leave it alone but apparently not that's the reason why Th that's the reason why it's it's not being talked about all the time people resort to wikipedia uh i can change make changes on wikipedia so it, you know wikipedia is a good start but it's a disaster when it comes to doing your research with wikipedia mm -hmm. you know it's 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 inane too much yeah Correct. absolutely and, and also uh, for, for you to really realize this whole concept of Armenian history and their role in ancient civilizations. Besides from knowing the language itself, you know, you have to understand their mythology. You know, you have to understand directionality too. You have to know who influenced who. Okay? Um, we had several scholars, uh, I think there are intentional distortions, but I mean, if, if you're calling the Armenian god Aramazd into a Persian god, um, you, you're reversing the truth. In other words, the directionality, instead of going from Armenia to Iran or Persia, it goes the other way around. Once you do that, your conclusions become incorrect because many scholars with their linguistic models have considered Armenian to be older than Greek, than Persian, Irish, and German, and so on. So you have to follow that scientific progress. And I think that even um, Russell Gray and Quentin Atkinson, I think they are constricting our language. It is much older than, than people think it is. Of course, you can put 9,000 years and that's it, and period. Yeah. That's how far you see, but it doesn't exactly. mean that it's only that, uh, that old. Uh, let me add one more thing uh, here in this uh, concept. Let me play the devil's advocate here. Sure. They are calling that Armenian uh, Aramaz is uh, Persian, came from Iran. But if people just bother a little bit, just a few minutes, waste a little bit of mental energy, yeah. and try to go back 3,000 years, mm -hmm. try to find out Mm -hmm. When 3,000 years ago, what was going on in Armenian highland, mm -hmm. culturally, uh, militarily, whatever, sure. we had huge empires, mm -hmm. uh, many empires, by the way. And 3,000 years ago, in a territory where later on was called Parthian Empire or Achaemenian Empire, mm -hmm. what was there 3,000 years ago, 1,000 BC? Yeah. Yeah, let me answer to you. Desert. Right. Nothing. That little piece of land that was called in Armenian Parsk, Mm -hmm. below Armenia, south of Armenia, mm -hmm. where later on Parthian Empire would be established, it was a little small land, a small tribe that went moved out of the Armenian plateau, went down south 3,000 years ago. And you call all of that much older than the original mother tongue that, mm -hmm. has, uh, uh, that has evolved mm -hmm. in a uh, Armenian highlands, sure. Armenian plateau. If you don't know the linguistics and you don't know the history of linguistics, right. you don't know the history of the nation movements, uh, you don't know what has happened in those areas and you just take one word mm -hmm. and you base your entire theory on one word just because it sounds Persian, sure. then what are you doing? Right. And uh, the, the problem with some of the uh, comparative linguists is when they try to examine 
the Iranian language with the Armenian Hittite and so on. Um, the, the problem with that is uh, they don't consider the whole picture of where in the world Armenian language exists. I mean, you can go to Basque, Spain, mm -hmm. you have Armenian there. Uh, you can go back 6,000 years, you have Sumerians using Armenian letters and, 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 and terms and words. You can go to Egypt, you can find Armenian words there. You can go to India, you can find Armenian words there. Armenian language is the only language that you can go anywhere in the world and you will find something. You can even go to Polynesia and find it. Exactly. Now, you know, sometimes they say, you know what, you know, you're playing with words, but this is the problem. Uh, those people there in those respective continents, not only are they, are they using the Armenian words that sound the same, they mean the same thing. What are the odds of, of finding an Armenian word that is, sounds the same and means the same thing in Polynesia? They have 2,000 there. They have Basque. I mean, you, you have a minimum of 500 Basque words in Armenian that a Basque people can talk to Armenian and converse with one another. It only tells me as a neutral bystander, sure. tells me one thing. The people must have immigrated, sure. moved out of uh, Armenian plateau sure. some time ago over the uh, Mediterranean Sea mm -hmm. to uh, Pyrenees and established themselves a new neighborhood, new country, new place, new homeland mm -hmm. that looks the same as Armenia mm -hmm. and feels the same as Armenia but has also two uh, oceans or one ocean, one uh, sea. Mm -hmm. And they felt comfortable and they kept their language and kept their culture. We are here in Glendale, I don't know, 8,000 miles from Armenia, we mm -hmm. speak Armenia, right? Sure. We have our culture with us, mm -hmm. don't we? Right. So the same way those people have moved out and they took their own culture and language with them. Sure. So that's why the Basques would have that uh, language and the geographic names mm -hmm. of rivers and mountains. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of river and mountain, you know, we have Aralar in Armenia, they have Aralar in, in Basque. Yeah. You know, they have Araxes. We have uh, Lake Arax. Yeah, we, uh, they, they call Cave Karanza, we say Karanzov. Uh, so you, you, when you see all these things, it, it's, you, it, it's, you cannot dismiss that as a coincidence. It's a, it's a disaster. It's a statistical disaster for it to consider all this to be a coincidence, really. Let's take uh, the group of Armenians that lived in Armenian Plateau and all of a sudden they decided that they wanted to move down south to Egypt, sure. southwest, and uh, they went there and some people who lived in uh, Egypt called them Hyksos for whatever reason that name was established mm -hmm. for the invaders. At that time these Aryan people were invaders for the Egypt and uh, somebody decided to translate into sheep people, mm -hmm. sheep kings tribe. Most likely they had some sheep with them. Of course, they had to have sheep to eat or sure. that entire army had to be fed. Right. So they are taking one word and they're trying to explain the name of the nation by the ship they brought with them. It's the same as the Turks, uh, Seljuk Turks when they invaded Armenia. Mm -hmm. They actually were called black sheep uh, uh, tribe or white sheep tribe, they call themselves with their sheep colors, but that actuality did happen in history in the mm -hmm. uh, 11th century. Sure. They're trying to put uh, common <laughs> signs between Armenians and uh, right. Seljuks. Absolutely. So why not just study what Hyksos had brought to Egypt? I Hyksos uh, leaders had brought to Egypt swords that would cut mm -hmm. Egyptians' uh, armor, yeah. armor in half. Right. Right. Why don't they, uh, they talk about that? Right. Well, th that's, th that's what I mean. I mean, you, you really see a hundred years of distortions in our historical books, and we have to cut through this crap. Mm -hmm. A hundred years of, of, of a disaster from, and then we have to unearth the Armenian history from ash and debris. And for us to do that, you know, we really need intellectually honest people. I mean, we really need scholars who are interested in the truth, uh, because you have to realize that it doesn't matter what you do when it comes to ancient history. If, if you're not going to incorporate the Armenian history and language and culture into your analysis, your conclusions are going to be wrong. Um, I, I, I always stress this, I always stress this, and we have to be glad that science now is helping us to unearth all this information. You know, we can examine uh, ancient um, hieroglyphs now uh, from the Armenian dimensional standpoint. You know, you, you can see that there were certain words that were misinterpreted for example, for they had the God set. Well, it was written at ST as two consonants, but they forgot to, to pronounce the A uh in the beginning. So, ost 
and then you have Kir, so Astagir, which is uh, the higher upper Egypt and the lower Egypt, if you combine it, it becomes Astagir, which is, does mean stars. So uh, you see how the Armenian language has been immersed in different cultures, and then they, they take it to their own tangent. Now, just because it has been transferred to a different tangent, it doesn't mean the essence has, has not been remained so. It's just a matter of examining it from, from the Armenian lang language standpoint. And that's the, the disaster we're facing right now. On top of that, you have falsifiers um, or, or ignorant scholars who actually completely dismiss this dimension, which they're missing the third dimension, really. Recently, uh, when the Armenian scholars and um, uh, the scientists were able to uh, discover the caves in RNE, mm -hmm. and they discovered the old shoe and the winemaking facilities and everything else, the British had uh, an article written in uh, one of their newspapers, they said, now we have to take the Armenian history, the world history. Mm -hmm. We have to take the world history 5,000 years further back. Mm -hmm. Because uh, before that, the entire uh, world, Christian world, had placed 6,000 years as a limit to existence of the planet. Right. All of a sudden, we have structures that are 10,000 years old, were built in Armenia, in heart of Armenia, mm -hmm. and they can't explain how can structures be built 10,000 years ago when the world only exists 6,000 years. Right. Right. So they had to take back another 5,000 plus another 5,000 years to the human history sure. uh, and the civilization. Only they needed an excuse, uh, the wine facilities found in Arini, and also, as everybody knows or who is interested in the subject, they found a complete head of a young girl that was preserved in a stone. Mm -hmm. The entire head and the brain and everything was preserved. They took it right to England. I never heard of it be uh, since. I don't know what they're doing, right. but they're trying to do the tests and find out what kind of um, uh, DNA had that, yeah. uh, <laughs> that human being. You see, instead of uh, getting deeper into falsifications, now the scientists have an opportunity to look into the newer, uh, modern op um, discoveries in other history, uh, in other uh, scientific uh, uh, directions. Sure. Not only the history and the language, but they can also go into, <coughs> excuse me, into genetics, mm -hmm. right? And they can simply go into the modern uh, opportunities of the science and sure. try to put it all together. Sure. Yeah, I mean now we're using archaeogenetics, we're using microbiology now uh, for us to study the, the <coughs> human evolution and, and, and beings and, and uh, the Indo-European language and, and so on. Why constantly uh, repeat that the Armenians came from uh, Thrakia, which mm -hmm. is part of uh, Balkans, right. when we know very well that only one small group of people had actually come from the west east mm -hmm. otherwise mostly people traveled from the center out sure now they're taking one small group of people who have, has traveled from balkans back to Fr uh, prigia frigia yeah. prugia mm -hmm. uh, and they are constantly talking about that little group and right. they try to prove that little group right. is the mother nation of the entire aryan race that has lived in uh, asia minor yeah. for i don't know 30 40 thousand years right. i mean this is ridiculous even uh, Robert Ellis has mentioned that uh, the uh, Etruscans right. had migrated out of Well, Armenia. sure. Lydia and Phrygia and so on. He, he says that the, 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 the continents between Armenia and Etruria is basically one. It's the same people at different areas and different names and so on, but they're the same people. Uh, the, the problem with saying that the Armenians came from another location is basically you're dismissing history, you're dismissing archaeology, you're dismissing language, uh, <coughs> their culture and heritage for you to do that. You know, that's what, that's what in, in the age of information, when you say or claim something like that, you are really, uh, either you have been sleeping in your office for 50 years, had no contact with new theories, uh, or there is something wrong with you to, to name Armenian people as newcomers to their own lands. I mean, just because we say Urartu, it doesn't mean the same as Ararat. I mean, it's the same thing, with a different way of writing it. Uh, I mean, uh, even the, the petroglyphs in, uh, in Uhtasar and Jermadzor can be translated in Armenian. In other words, the goats, 
in a way, 80% uh, of the petroglyphs are goats. Uh, it has been known now that the earliest flag was found in Armenia as a petroglyph, carrying a goat in a, in a sun, in a, basically like a flag format. So we can see how uh, the, 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 the human progress coming into contact with human civilization and uh, how metallurgy and, uh, and agricultural uh, plants and animal domestications have really radiated out of the Armenian highlands. And most of this information is really preserved in the Armenian language itself. You see, the Armenian language is a fossil. It's not even a language, it's a fossil. It's a mathematical fossil. It's, it's just like the, uh, the dinosaur bones that we find. So you, you can't examine a dinosaur if you cannot examine the bones. Same thing with the, with the ancient history in, in, the, in the European language. If you cannot examine the Armenian language, you're missing the whole fossil. The, the centerpiece of the puzzle. Absolutely, absolutely. As, as you even said that all you know, arrows lead back to Armenia. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it does lead back there when it comes to civilization. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I have not heard any theory that uh, people from Ireland have traveled to Armenia. I haven't mm -hmm. heard that. Mm -hmm. But it's very natural, only natural, that if we believe in Bible, and we, if we believe that the Armenian, I mean, uh, the first humankind, Adam and Eve, were created by God in a, a Garden of Eden, which is in the heart of Armenia, sure. and then they multiplied in the heart of Armenia, and they start speaking some language which happened to be later on called Armenia. Right. And why don't you believe that those people multiplied, multiplied, and moved out? Right. Nothing in, uh, in nature ever comes from outside into the center. Everything goes from the center right. out. It disperses, exactly. That's how the universe works. Yeah. I mean, you have to look, even the Bible, I mean, you have to look at it as from a natural standpoint. I mean, you can't use it from, as a theological dogma. I mean, if you literally believe what's in there, you know, there's something wrong with you. You have to look at it from a natural standpoint. It's, it's not a literal translation. It's, it's allegorical. Mm -hmm. It's a metaphorical. You know, it talks about the stars. It's, mm -hmm. it's astro-theological scripture. It talks about the stars. It talks about certain events that has taken place that has nothing to do with the supernatural. It has to do with the natural order of things. And of course, you know, when you have uh, people who take it literally, they take it to the wrong tangent. And, and right there is a falsification as well. I wanted to talk about it, but I'll talk about it next time. Yeah. We have, in, oh, besides from historical falsifications, we have theological falsifications, especially coming from Abrahamic cults and the three major branches. They are indirect falsifications of human history, of Armenian history. It's, it's irreconcilable. And I'll talk about it next time, but uh, I'll give you a chance to continue with, with this discussion itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, naturally. Now, uh, for us, for Armenian people, and in general those who are interested in uh, truthfulness of the history, sure. a, a lot of, let's put it this way, some politicians mm -hmm. say that history is a false criteria. False, because they politicians constantly falsify it. Right. If they w just left the history alone, if they just didn't bother it, if they just didn't uh, turn it around and smashed it, history would have been a real nice science. Mm -hmm. But the politicians have to ruin it, and then they call it false. Yeah. Why they do that? Because they have to make sure that everything serves their purpose, right. purpose of the politicians. Why would Armenians have this kind of history. Let's uh, limit ourselves with the 10,000 years that we know already. Right. See, a few years ago, we were calling Armenian history to be eight to 10,000 years old. People looked at us like we were crazy or something. We right. lost our brains, right? Now, it has been proven already right. with facts, with new uh, discoveries. Now, if we only limit ourselves with this 10,000 years and we say, okay, if that people, that group of people lived and uh, created things on that land 10,000 years ago. Why are you trying to bring them from somewhere else? This is my uh, beef with these people. Mm -hmm. If you are telling me that Armenians came from somewhere, from Africa or from Macedonia, or whatever, can you show me one structure, one uh, cemetery, one graveyard, one gravestone that the Armenians have left behind if they lived there before, then they must have had some kind sure. of structure. Right. They must have had some kind of graveyard yeah. where they buried their uh, dead, right? Show me one. 
if you show me one, I'll show you one million and one in right. Armenia, in Asia mi uh, Minor. Right. So that, that yeah. is my uh, sure. problem with them. Uh, as, as you already mentioned, I mean, you, you realize now how intellectually and logically bankrupt their analysis is when they try to falsify the Armenian and human history altogether. You know, it's, it's, it's completely bankrupt. It doesn't map onto reality at all. I mean, uh, you have, for example, the, uh, the, the topics about the Aryans, for example. It's an interesting one. But you cannot talk about the Aryans when you do not define the word Aryan in Armenia. Yeah, I mean, try to, to, to explain that in Turkish. What would you get? Yeah, I don't, yeah exactly. I mean, th there is a reason why it's called Aryan. I mean, Armenians have the ending with Y-A-N or I-A-N now. There's a reason. You know, A-R, those two terms, two letters, R. Armenians probably surpass 200 to 1 with other languages when it comes to the word R in their language, in their words. They have the beginning, in the middle, at the end. More than 10,000 words, I might say, uh, that R starts with R or ends with R or is in the middle of the, of the word itself. And there's a reason why for it, because you know, they're worshippers of R, R people, the Sam people. So when they go to different places throughout history, uh, they take the Sam worship and, and, and all the aspects to those lands. They take it, they interpret it their own way, they incorporate some of the words into their own scripture, and they take it into their own tangent. But it doesn't mean that you have to separate this from the Armenians themselves, or not even talk about it. I mean, look at, look at the, uh, the Indian scriptures, the Rig Veda, okay? If you look at it the opposite way, Rig becomes Gir, which means written. Aveda means Avetaran. Gir, Avetaran. It's an Armenian word. Even the uh, Iranian Avesta, Avesta is Avetaran. So again, the directionality needs to change. Instead of from Iran to Armenia, it goes from Armenia to Iran because the language is older, the people are older. If you, hear, uh, if you uh, read the Gershman uh, r uh, written work, it says that the, the, the Persian culture has its foundation from the Armenian highlands. He says that. Well, we, I cannot imagine how could it be otherwise if in that desert land that is mostly Iran right. could have uh, human race could have developed. Right. It's impossible. Humans right. do not develop in desert. Right. They only develop in the area where the so-called uh, Garden of Eden was. Right. When they multiplied, then they went out to the yeah. other lands. And they went south towards Mesopotamia. And they went southeast towards oh, yeah. today's Iran. Part. Well, yeah. All the way far east until uh, they reached uh, China and Japan. Sure. I mean, we have to hear what others say about us. You know, that's the other problem. People completely dismiss that. Sumerians talk about us, Basque talks about us, right? I mean, they, they, in their folk tales, they say that their ancestors came from Armenian highlands, right? Yeah. So if Armenians are newcomers to that place, why would Basque say that they, we came from Armenia when there was an Armenian culture there? Why would the Bavarians say that? Why would the uh, Bretons say that? Right, right. I mean, uh, uh, th there's a reason why it's written, and y y you don't have to take it from a supernatural standpoint. I always say this. Don't take it from a supernatural standpoint. The natural is enough. Mm -hmm. Natural is enough for us to say, for us to see all these things are happening. For example, uh, Hugh Fox, uh, several decades ago, he wrote the book called uh, Gods of Cataclysm. And he was talking about this uh, theory that there were one group of race or ethnic group that went all around the world and disseminated all this uh, sun worship and language all throughout the, uh, the, the whole continents and the world. But he misappropriated it to another ethnic group. He named it the Phoenicians. Now, this is the problem with that, okay? He's using Armenian words to explain his findings, but he's not saying it was the Armenians. He's saying the Phoenicians. Why? Because he doesn't know Armenian. Let me give you an example. He said that when Phoenicians came to the New World, in other words, South America or North America, they didn't know what the land was. He's writing this, I'm quoting this. He said that those Phoenicians named it the place as An Anun. <laughs> okay, what does An Anun mean? It means a place with no name, right? But why wouldn't you say it's Armenia as opposed to Phoenician? Because he doesn't know Armenian. That's exactly my point. And even if he said it's Armenian, that book wouldn't be published. Right. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be published, but at the same time, it's, uh, now people realize that if you don't know what you don't know, you're not going to know what to look for. 
interesting example is uh, Armen Davtian, scientist, sumer sumerologist in Armenia. He says people were trying to translate Sumerian texts into some kind of uh, non-existent languages, okay. but they didn't speak Armenian. Once you try to go through Armenian, mm -hmm. then it explains itself. The words are 90% the same. Exactly. You don't have to invent another language. Exactly. Even their gods. I mean, Sumerians had a god, Utu, which mm -hmm. means Ut, right? Mm -hmm. Eight. Uh, they had Inni, which is Inna, which means nine. Mm -hmm. So they already were applying mathematical names to their gods. Mm -hmm. Eight and nine and things like that. So, uh, so that's why the Armenian language itself is not only a, 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 an expression of a sound, you know, it, it has its hidden dimension, it is, it's a mathematical language. There is a lot of astronomical universal information that so-called Sumerian people have written down right. and they have left, thank God, left on those clay tablets mm -hmm. that were buried under the sand mm -hmm. and thank God after 4,000 years were discovered and through those uh, writings and cuneiform uh, writings on the clay tablets, we find out what these people knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, besides all they knew, they called Armenia Barepasht Arkaneri Yergir, mm -hmm. a country of very, Barepasht, uh, uh, I don't know the word in English, uh, very truthful or honest or big heart Worshiping. kings, right. big hearted kings. Mm -hmm that uh, followed rules and regulations, that right. they were very honest. Uh, I used many words to, sure. to give the meaning of Barepasht. Right. And Sumerians called Armenian kings that way. Absolutely. That's why they called the Armenian highland and the people a land of the gods. As There's a the reason region. why they were saying it. Not because there were actually gods there, but the Armenian people themselves were considered as gods because they were so advanced uh, in their knowledge of astronomy, astrology. Uh, so. For them, it was this extraordinary culture. And that's why they've wrote in the inscriptions that their forefathers came from Arata mm -hmm. or, or, or Ararat. Mm -hmm. So Arata, Ararat, Urartu is the same thing. Hayasa, Hayastan is the same thing. Uh, so Armen, Hay, whatever. Whatever you use, it means the same thing. And, and people need to know this. Armenians or non-Armenians. If you don't know this distinction or you don't realize that it's the same, you're missing the whole picture. For 100, 120 years, I would say, right. Armenian people has been bombarded with lies, mm -hmm. falsification, and putting down the Armenian race, right. killing them, murdering them, and destroying their culture and distorting their past. Right. Now, after all this kind of beating that we took, now try to explain a young generation now People, us, who have grown up under the Soviet system, sure. try to explain to the young people that when we went to the universities and we tried to study something and a communist teacher would constantly say that we don't have history, we don't have anything, right. thanks to the communists, thanks, thanks to this and that, that we do exist. Right. And everything that we have had in the past is nonsense. Right. We have been through communist uh, genocide right. after 1915 we have gone through communist genocide right. see young Turk geno uh, young Turks carried out a physical genocide young Russian communist Bolsheviks carried out another genocide right. how many people know that out of 100 uh, one and a half million Armenian population in 1941 400,000 Armenians went to the uh, war mm -hmm. to fight Germans mm -hmm. 400,000. 300,000 lost their lives. Can you imagine? Look, look at the percentage. Right. Wasn't that a genocide? The Stalin carried out another genocide after the World War II. Right. Send them all to Siberia. They are trying to uh, do another genocide now, mm -hmm. sending Armenians to Russia, to right. Siberia. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people are ruthless. They have been working on us for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why we older generation, we're trying to ask you, the younger uh, generation of scientists, please uh, raise your voice. Tr please try to tell the uh, people out there, the scientists, the academia out there, look, it's not the way, the way you hear is not the truth. Right. The truth lies under the ruins of Armenian civilization right. in Asia Minor. That's exactly. what the truth exactly. is. Exactly. We have to take from ashes to historical pages. 
Mm -hmm. and, and for us to do that, we need to embrace truth, we need to embrace intellectual honesty, uh, we need to embrace all the data that we have without cherry picking our way through it. And I'm going to add another dimension, which is the psychological dimension, which, which I want to talk about. Uh, there are two problems with trying to examine all this history. When, when you are not uh, mentally healthy, uh, when it comes to reviewing all this. It, it becomes a, a, a intellectual disaster. Well, one of them is inferiority complex, okay? Uh, inferiority complex has different dimensions. Um, you can actually feel bad about who you are because for so many generations they told you that you're bad and you're insignificant and so on. That's one. Uh, the other thing is uh, the cognitive dissonance. Uh, that's, that's another one that people don't realize. The cognitive dissonance is where you grow up in a certain information age, and then when new information comes in, for you it's a shock, so you try to push that away. So when you have been born in a certain geographical area where you have been told that your people came from different lands, now you have a scientist that comes and says, no, you have been living there for a very long time. Well, that's cognitive dissonance. Combine that with inferiority complex, now you didn't want to embrace the truth anymore. And I see this in my, in my book, in the Enigma of the Armenian Alphabet. There's a reason why that book is, is brief. Uh, there's a, I wrote it so people can completely comprehend what's going on in the, in the world when it comes to history. When you are indoctrinated into a certain viewpoint, whatever new information comes in, you're going to reject it. There's a wall. There, there is a wall. And unless this uh, feeling and, and intellectual honest you know, force is behind you to break away from all this, you are not going to accept any new information that comes in. That's how religion works, that's how inferiority complex works, and cognitive dissonance works. So it's really time for everybody to really embrace all this history that we have in front of us. Uh, I can reassure you, once people start looking at this from this dimension, all the historical books are going to change. Let me add something. I, don't, I hope I didn't interrupt. Good. I, I want to add something from my experience. Right. There are people, then when we talk about this subject, there are people who just look at your face in oh, oh my God, what are you talking about? Yeah. No, it can't be true. It right. can't be that way. We heard, oh, my professor said something else. Yeah. Or oh, in that university, whatever, telling me something else. They just can't take it. Right. Now you have to work very hard on these people. Try to make him just sit back, relax, and listen to what I'm saying. I'm giving you another piece of information, another piece of the puzzle. Try, but that takes decades. Sure. People have, uh, have like brainwashed. Right. It's very hard. That's why, the, again, we come back to the younger generation of the scientists. So you can talk to the newer generation of the Armenians who are ready and willing and able to listen. Absolutely. Our older generation is brainwashed by the Turkish fear and a fear of a communism, a fear of communist Kagibe. They can't hear you. Right. And they don't see any reason why should they listen to you. Right. For them, it's over. Oh man, my life is over. I can't go into that anymore. Too right. late for me. Yeah. That's why the new young generation of Armenians, uh, especially we got uh, every year we have thousand young men and women uh, uh, graduating from uh, California universities. Mm -hmm. So where are these young people going? Right. They have to be prepared to the truth. Right. Like Jack Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth, <laughs> but we must. Yeah give them enough information so they can handle the truth. Sure. The, the information is out there. Um, and, and, and what I want to emphasize mostly is that if, if when you're ready to embrace the truth, it's really waiting out there for you. It's just a matter of you taking that extraordinary leap. And it's not that of a great of a leap. I mean, you no. really have to embrace not even your own culture, but the human history overall. I mean, you have to look at it from a natural timeline who influenced who. And for you to do that really is you have to read uh, <laughs> not only American books, but you have to read the European journals, you have to read scientific journals themselves, comparative linguistic analyses and so on. So all these you have to take into account. And unless, unless you take this dimension that I mentioned into consideration, your conclusions are going to be wrong. Now, uh, let me ask you, uh Simple but hard question. Sure. Where do you think your generation of scientists, uh, academia, has to start now? We have to just kind of throw all this in the trash, what has happened in the past. We have to start it all new. Right. You have to be able to give this new young 
Armenians uh, a route, a true, honest way of studying themselves, mm -hmm. their history, and their future. But like Shumeria said, whatever has happened in the past is going to happen in the future. What's going to happen in the future has already happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Sumerian tablet. Now, if everything has already happened in the past, mm -hmm. can't we just look at the true history, true historical facts, and study it from them? Then we see the future. Sure. Can we do it that way? Yeah. Well, I can because people need to be ready. You know, you have to realize that certain academicians and scholars, uh, when they have a, a certain theory that they, they, they support, when they see new information comes in, they always reject it because they don't want their hard work to go in vain. And uh, same thing with Egyptologists, for example. I don't know why people think that the, the Sphinx was made by the Egyptians. I mean, the Absolutely not. You see, but the mainstream thinks that they have built the, the Sphinx. So-called Egyptians have started their existence only like two and a half thousand, three thousand years BC. Right. That's where the, this so-called Egypt has uh, originated. Right. And Sphinx, Americans are, uh, have proven already right. lately that is at least 12 to 14,000 years old. It has to be. At it least. has to be because, you, uh, as, as I mentioned, you have to look at what has been written or what has been orally given to us from an astrotheological standpoint. You know, you have to understand the stars. You know, you have to realize why is the Sphinx to a certain extent facing a certain direction. F facing the sun. So if you look at that, it becomes anachronistic for us to say it was built by the Egyptians because if you go to the age of Leo, you don't have Egyptians there anymore. Mm -hmm. But from a, even from a linguistic standpoint, you already have Armenians going back at that time. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Let me give you uh, an example. About eight years ago, I was walking up, uh, climbing up mountains in Armenia. And, uh, one of the mountains called Ajdahak mm -hmm. in uh, Gerarkunik. There are millions and millions of petroglyphs. So we ran into one that is two meters by one and a half meters, and we were just shocked. Mm -hmm. On a basalt rock is carved the entire Milky Way galaxy with all the stars in their absolute correct position. Mm -hmm. And the zodiac, 12 signs, boom, 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 12 of them, in exact position the way they are in the universe. Right. And this is like 3000 BC. Now you tell me. The Whoever did this, mm -hmm. did they know the universe? Well, of course they have. And the, it actually proves the point that those people have been gazing the stars for a very, very long time. I mean, if you have Portasar, which is now called Gobekli Tepe, but you know, if we look at from ancient Armenian standpoint, if you look at the structure, you know, you have to realize that those people have been around for a very, very long time. Before that, for them to know the stars, for them to do all that, it's a burial ground intentionally covered and things like that. So uh, you have to, uh, again, push back time even further all the time. And the more we see it, the more we push back further. And, and uh, human civilization really um, has been the, the pinnacle of, uh, of, of, of success when it comes to us realizing what we have been missing. And uh, one of the problem is that you know, people don't see it that way. Um, they, they, they do not want to see it that way because they have been taught, like you mentioned, in universities uh, that it has to be a certain way as opposed to another. And by doing that, you are really hurting uh, the history of the human civilization. We, we can even not talk about the Armenian civilization, just even a human civilization itself. Um, when you don't consider the truth or, or even consider all what, ha what has been happening in their proper timeline, uh, you are doing a disservice to your children uh, to future generations, and all they're going to do is just read falsehoods and think that they're doing justice. I mean, we really have to honor the, uh, our ancestors, what they have done for us. Yes. But what happened was, approximately 1,700 years ago, we destroyed all that in Armenia, completely. 99.9% .9 of the Armenian culture was destroyed. New religion comes in, burns everything. Now we're trying to unearth all this information forward and becomes uh, a tedious task because you have theological forces that, that don't want you to know all that. I mean, look at their websites. They, you know, they, they talk about certain things that is not even true. Um, even our own theological websites. That's, that's problem number one. And, and two, you, know, you have American historians, professors, 
they lie about the Armenian history. And you have Armenian students going there and learning about their history. And, and they learn that they came from somewhere else. Well, and I must uh, admit that, unfortunately, those who are falsifying our history are being well paid. Mm -hmm. They are not doing it for fun. They are doing it for money. And if you follow the money trail, you will catch the culprit. Yeah. And they are doing, they are order, uh, following the orders. Yeah. We are not paying our honest scientists to work and publish books. In Armenia, there are quite a few real right. good quality of scientists, but who is right. paying them? Yeah, Nobody. Exactly. But the falsifiers go to Armenia and become uh, members of the academia. Right. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. Uh, That's where the problem is now. <coughs> we have to open up the eyes of the young generation to understand what's going on. Uh, my main question, why do you think it is so important for uh, Armenians in general, but young Armenians, uh, scientific Ar uh, Armenians and uh, Armenian Academia, why is it so important to tell the young uh, generation that is going through the colleges and universities the truth? Mm -hmm. Why? The truth hurts. Why do you want to hurt your uh, young generation right. well, by giving them the truth? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the truth is a bitter pill, really. It's, it's very bitter. But once you take it, you'll be well soon. So we're trying to have that small pill of truth given to people in our younger generation, and hopefully within the United States and abroad. You know, I'm hoping that at least this video will invigorate them to learn more about their roots. And uh, Is it true that the truth shall set all of us free? Absolutely. Absolutely. So they're, Free. Kind of, they're <laughs> confronting each other, those two ideas, right? Yeah. The truth hurts, but yeah, at the same yeah. time... Well, it's a paradox, really. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to face the paradox if we're going to find anything meaningful behind what we well, read. It looks like we have to smell the coffee. <laughs> Isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, if you uh, were to think about it and what direction the other um, younger uh, scientists or folks who are interested in studying the true uh, history of Armenian people or in general history of the Mesopotamia or history of the world mm -hmm. or people who, who are interested in finding out the truth. All right. What can we suggest them? Well, uh, I mean, if you ask me whether there is one single book in the United States mm -hmm. that has been published about the truthful Armenian history, I'm mm -hmm. going to say it's zero. Zero. It's zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll talk about uh, certain areas that are true, but the majority of it is, is completely missing. So we have to go to scientific journals in nature. You know, we have to read the ancient, well, not ancient, but 150 years ago books on, let's say, by Robert Ellis, for example, uh, Charles Morris. Um, we have to look at the lingu linguists, Hubschmann. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to do that. Uh, we have to really go to the internet and find relevant data that can be extracted right away. Um, we have very good scholars here uh, in the United States as well. We have Kevork Nazarian, for example. He's, he's phenomenal. He, his guy is, is his encyclopedia. So there are people out there, and uh, if they can contact me, I'm sure I can okay. lead them the way. Well, we have to end our program uh, on this note today because mm -hmm. the time is limited and uh, in anticipation of having another meeting with you so we can continue our uh, discussions on a little bit different uh, direction, but on main subject, of course. Uh, we can cover other uh, uh, areas, our other fields, and other uh, material. Juan, I really appreciate your uh, willingness to come and spend Thank time with us me. and Thank uh, you. express your thoughts and ideas. Uh, out to our viewers, I have to say, people, you have to read. You have to read and you have to study, uh, and only the truth will set us free. For finally, my word is let's learn, let's study and let's get educated, and then we have a right to express our ideas and our thoughts. So far, this program came to an end, uh, dear friends, and we will continue on next time. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Juan, thank you very much for thank being you. with us thank on this you. program. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it.